Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Cybersecurity Standup. Um, it's day three of the Gartner Security and Risk Management Summit. Um, and I'm here with Seth. Seth, we've been friends on LinkedIn for a while now, so I've seen some of your amazing work. Um, can, in case people haven't heard of you, can you tell them who you are and what you currently do? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, everyone. My name is Seth Goldhammer. I run product management for a company called Greylog. We're in the, the SIM log management and API security space. And so we're on day three of Gartner, so you've probably at this point walked around like 17 times, had some great conversations. What's your first impression? How has it been? How's the show been this year compared to other years? That kind of stuff. Yeah, what's, what's really interesting, I think, about this year, you know, clearly the buzzword is AI, yeah. but, but actually, I'm going to completely skip the buzzword. An interesting theme, I think, for Gartner this year is, is failure, the acceptance of failure. Okay. And it's been very interesting because I actually, I can't, I'm not sure I'm ready to accept failure as a part of our objective, uh -huh. but I can clearly understand Gardner's, uh, what, what they're trying to impress is that, look, breaches are going to happen. Right. We need to understand that breaches will happen and make that part of our process rather than take a failure is not an option mentality. Uh -huh. And so, but I'm interested in what other people have to think about, about this premise that, that Gardner is pushing this year. Yeah, definitely. How does that tie in? I feel like uh, one of the other things that I've seen too is a uh, tendency towards having proactive strategies as opposed to reactive ones. So it kind of seems almost like an antithesis of that, say accepting failure, but we're also trying to be proactive. Any thoughts on that? Well, it, a lot of it's very contradictory. Yeah. We're, we're stalwarts of data. We're trying to protect not only employees, but our customers, clients, everyone who participates with our organization we're in a position to help protect them from bad people. And I take that as a vendor, I take a lot of responsibility in that. And so I believe that our mission is still the mission. And so to accept that, well, there's an acceptable amount of data loss, there's an acceptable amount of breach, that's, that's a tough pill for me to swallow. So I agree, I think we still need to be very proactive in terms of how are we setting ourselves up to be in a position to protect the data that we are the the stalwarts for. On the same hand, if something does happen, we do need to be in a position where we there can be open communication across the company of what's happening. And I, I agree with Gardner, that type of transparency is very important. Yes. Seems like also with the, you know, let's let's say a broadly acceptance of failure, that does seem like a good move in terms of removing the shame that I feel like is kind of inherent in that conversation too. Absolutely. Yeah, there, there is no shame because we all know it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And it doesn't matter how sophisticated your organization is, how many tools you have in your organization, how many people are on your security team. We still see breaches happen. And so I think we do want to take these opportunities to create learning opportunities, not just for that own organization, but for others as well. And that's where I think that transparency can be very key to help with that learning experience. Yes. Yeah, well said. Absolutely. Um, so, Seth, um, what, in your opinion, you're going to leave this conference, you've got all this new knowledge, you've had a good experience, all that kind of stuff. What conversations do you feel like we should be having more often? What's top of mind that you feel like is like getting kind of forgotten? Well, I, there was a great keynote this morning that talked about burnout. Uh -huh. And again, as a vendor, I feel very responsible. In fact, I put out a post on LinkedIn about, about this because I feel that as a vendor, we're in a position to help people to have rewarding experiences with their role in cybersecurity. And if our product is creating a burnout scenario, well, in some ways, as a vendor, we're responsible for that. So, and so I'd really like to talk to not just security leaders, but those people in the trenches, the analysts, people who are responding to alerts on a daily basis. How do we help create a, a balance between what the information that they need to see in order to be able to take an action yep. on something that's happening in the environment, but also give them opportunity to take a break from that. And I, I'm very open to ideas in that regard. Yeah, I love it. What's something that you do in your own life to avoid burnout? I, I, uh, that's a great question. I would like to say that what I'm supposed to be working on is my truck, which is a 56 oh. Ford pickup that's in an auto cocoon in my front lawn that my wife is really wondering when I'm gonna go uh -huh. do something with that. Uh -huh. So this summer I'm here, I'll, I'm gonna say it. So now I'm accountable for it. 
I'm, that truck is going to be up and running before the end of the summer. I'm, I'm hopeful. Well, I shouldn't say hopeful. I'm going to make that happen. Yes. I like it. Amazing. Um, you know, one thing I, I also really like to ask folks about, especially at actually at, at this show, um, is their their career path and how they've gotten into cyber, what that journey has been like. Can you tell me about yours? Yeah, so I it, it is actually a very interesting story. So I appreciate you asking. I do not have a traditional cybersecurity or even an IT background. My background was I was an English major. I studied film in my undergrad. Uh, in Southern California, I thought I was going to be a screenwriter and computers and networking was a hobby of mine and I kept working more on computers and more on networking and I ended up starting a company with a friend of mine that ended up being a precursor to network access control. Wow. I, I won't go into all of that, but believe it or not, 9-11 played a role in that because we were building a, a platform for wireless applications in airlines, in airports, and after 9-11, Airports came back to us and said, well, baggage reconciliation, self-check-in, that's probably not going to happen right now. Right. But you said you could stop applications and stop users on a wireless network. We need to talk about that. And so we end up building more of that network access control side of it. And uh, that led to really this career that I've had in cybersecurity. Incredible. Wow. Okay. What is something, I mean... That's so exciting. <laughs> Thank you. I, I also have a background in, in literature, really, and, and linguistics, actually. And I, I think it's really heartening, actually, for people to hear that. Because if you are passionate about technology, like, as a hobby or on the side, you're still welcome in this industry. Um, do you have any advice for people who are looking to get into it now? Yeah, I mean, I'm very biased because I see an English degree as a method by which to help you understand how to communicate. Yeah, and it and it doesn't matter what your career is, whether it's in technology or outside of technology, understanding how to communicate with people is such an important skill. And especially in my role in product management, it's how to understand for each audience, how do they want to be communicated with? Because there's business, there's technical, there's internal, there's external. And so I think for, for anyone who's listening, to build that soft skill set for understanding how to communicate with each type of audience that you're interacting with, that's that absolutely can make or break careers in yeah. terms of being able to communicate to the right people in the right way that they want to learn. Um, not the first time I've heard that, and I completely agree with you, but I have to ask the follow-up question, which I have, which is how, if you're someone who wants to learn those soft skills or improve them, how do people go about doing that? Excellent question. And there are there's certainly resources in terms of books or podcasts or even uh, was it toasters? There's you know clubs that you can go to. Oh, yeah, uh, Toastmasters. Toastmasters. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. And I I think the most important part of any of that, whether it's uh, whichever avenue you you take, yeah. it's practice. You, there, no one is ever comfortable talking to people. And if you're an introvert, getting in front of someone and talking to someone is, is always going to be challenging. Anyone who gives a keynote who says they're not nervous before they get on that stage, they're lying. Everyone's nervous it's before true. they get on a stage. And so the only way to start doing it is to start doing it. And it's just to practice, to practice, to practice. And it will become more comfortable over time and if it, but you need to be open to creating those experiences for yourself. Yeah. Love it. I agree. And and you're right. I am also a secret introvert and every single time I do an episode with someone, I got to come all the way down. You know, adrenaline is like leaving my body, you know. It's it's a whole experience. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. So you I, I don't want to say channel those nerves cuz that sounds too cheesy. Uh -huh. I think cuz those nerves are always going to be there. Yeah. I think it's really just the more you do it, the more you recognize what you're what you feel like. Yeah, it's just a part of it. That's yeah, right. Exactly. exactly right. Um, well, Seth, you've been incredibly generous with your time. I really appreciate you stopping by. If people want to connect with you or find you on the internet, how can they do so? Uh, in a couple places, I'm certainly on LinkedIn, as I mentioned before. I'm also trying out Threads. So if you want to find me, I'm I'm at so called Seth. Uh, it's an old DJ name, believe it or not. <laughs> so so called Seth on Threads uh, is where I'm. Those are going to be more just jokes. But if you want to reach out to me in a professional light, that would be on LinkedIn. Okay, fantastic. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. And we will see you next time out in cyberspace. <laughs>